like I'm as eager as anybody to like nerd out on athletic programming and, you know, like really like drill down. But I think I've come to, I've come to believe that, that there are greater outcomes on the battlefield than only the physicality. And if we do those other things right, the physicality will follow pretty, pretty seamlessly. Uh, welcome back, friends, for another um, sit-down conversation with, with Drew and Alex. This week, we're going to take you all the way over to Italy and the 173rd. Alex, who do we have this week? It's a, a widely requested guest. A number of you have slid into the DMs asking for this one. We have Colonel Michael Klepper on the podcast today. He's a 1997 West Point graduate a 2015 graduate of the Keenan Flagler Business School at North Carolina Chapel Hill. Go Hills. And he is a 2021 distinguished graduate of the Army War College. He's an infantry, a ranger, and a power trooper, and that's basically defined his entire career. He did platoon leader time in Ranger Regiment, company command in both 173rd and Ranger Regiment, spent some time in 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, and then once again, Battalion Command in both 173rd and Ranger Regiment. And he is now the commander of the 173rd Airborne Brigade doing great things in Italy and across Europe, which is a a little bit spicy right now. Um, And unsurprisingly, over the course of those assignments, numerous deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And it comes up in the conversation here, but he's He's very much on social media and he is accessible to his soldiers there. Like really accessible. Like you can text him. (laughs) Um, But he, you'll see frequently family content on there. He and his wife, Ellen, and their three teenage boys are constantly out doing some pretty intense stuff in the mountains of Italy and around Europe and things like that. Getting after it on skis, on foot just physical activity all weekend long, every chance they get out in the mountains. And one of the reasons we wanted to have him on to chat is because when you think of kind of the landscape of the army specifically, but really the, I guess the military at large and the rise of embedded human performance programs and what that means at kind of the command level, uh, Colonel Klepper for, for not having any of those resources yet has done a phenomenal job implementing change in a positive direction, whether that's issuing, you know, weekend passes for physical feats, um, like we mentioned, being incredibly accessible to his paratroopers, but just the the ways in which he has not only kind of talked the talk, but walked the walk, I, I think is really incredible. And for folks that have heard him speak publicly, I mean, he always gets a round of applause when he sort of challenges some of the, we'll call them status quo, uh, in, in terms of, of army infrastructure around supporting soldiers. And our conversation today is going to center on two things, both of which you can find in the show notes to look at them for yourself. But one is the the policy letter number two that Colonel Klepper signed. And you'll hear the story of how that came to be. But the, the title of the policy letter is Cohesion and the Pursuit of Excellence. And it's essentially the, the incentives program they implemented in 173rd. And it's got a lot of attention army-wide. So we'll talk about that a bit, and then we'll also talk about the presentation he gave at the H2F Symposium a few weeks ago, and you'll find a link to the DVIDs recording of that whole presentation, and I highly recommend taking a few minutes to go through that. You'll hear about some some really impactful programs they've been implementing at their brigade that I think could very easily be implemented just about anywhere, and he talks about kind of the data they've been looking at for results, and it's really compelling. So again, going to Italy, grab a pizza, pour yourself a little glass of red wine, uh, and enjoy. It's Memorial Day weekend. I want to know what sort of physical challenges you've already accomplished. It's, I guess for you, it's Monday night, but between what, Friday and Monday, how many miles have you logged? (laughs) So we spent uh my wife and i and our two younger boys spent uh friday and saturday in val de gardenia it's up on the uh, austrian border and we uh we did two really really great you know sort of mountain mountain treks the first one was we advertised that i advertised it to be eight and ended up being 13 miles <laughs> And then the, the, the second one was like the, just like this quintessential waterfall hike um, that was five miles. And then yesterday, 
my 18 year old and I went and did another five miler. So not a, not a ton of mileage, but pretty scenic and good elevation gain. I like the, uh, I like the advertised shorter than it actually is kind of hikes. I've done that to the guys I work with. We were out at JBLM and the hike was supposed to be like three or four miles. And once we were like four miles in and hadn't turned around, they started to realize what was going on. Yeah. Well, now my, my wife's gotten to the point where she demands to see like whatever the digital app is that I'm using to plan it. She wants to see the readout. Like what, what do we actually show me? <laughs> They're saying, learning. Being off by like two miles is one thing being off by five miles. I mean, that's like, uh, that's big. It's all about, it's all about the decision points that you keep in your back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome okay i want to know you, you mentioned this i think you mentioned this in your presentation at the h2 symposium but for folks that are unaware of this kind of policy letter that you're known for can you like tell the story of how that came about because we'll we'll include a, a picture of the policy letter in the show notes but i want to hear the story around it yeah um so the story is actually the story is maybe the most uh, remarkable thing. It, so it, it was a paratrooper's idea. So this guy in first of the 503rd sent me a text message. Um, and he basically said like, hey, so there's not, there's not like a ton to do. And young paratroopers, I mean, he like laid it out with. Wait, can I pause? Can I pause you? One of your paratroopers just texted you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I get like three or four a week. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's, first of all, that in and of itself is incredible. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, um, he like laid it out with, with remarkable clarity and maturity. He basically said, you know, and I'll use my words, but what he laid out was there's not much to do. We're isolated. The drinking age is 18 and young people come young men and women come and sort of get wrapped up in just drinking in the barracks. And it'd be good if we could incentivize, incentivize them to get out a little bit. And so it started like with a big framework. And so he, he and I went back and forth a couple of times and like with the, with like the structure of it. And then he, he sort of came back and said, we, we could come up with points for weekends. And then, uh, and he came up with probably a third of the ideas and then we iterated it through the company command teams and like the battalion command teams and, you know, sort of like circulated through the sergeant major channels. Um, and then, yeah, and then it sort of, it sort of worked. Uh, and at least, you know, sort of knock wood is, is, it seems like it's having a relatively pretty good impact, but the story, the fact that it came from a paratrooper, um, yeah, the story is is maybe the best part of it. Just to get him a shout out, is that specialist Harrison Turney that proposed it? it? Yeah, it is absolutely. Did uh did his chain of command know he was like texting with the brigade commander about a new policy letter when he was doing it? <laughs> That's how I asked the question. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but he, you know, he's great. We got we got just tons and tons of great great people. I'm I'm looking at it now. Graduate Rangers, hundred points. Enroll and complete ACS. So is this something, I mean, did, did the, the paratroopers take to this pretty, pretty well? Has it, has it made a good impact on the brigade? I think, um, so the, the first thing is, you know, it's not perfect. And, you know, like we just, we just sort of did our best. And I think if we were to revise it, uh, if we were to revise it, we'd probably change some of the point weighting and we come up with some, you know, different activities and stuff, but just sort of where I'm at in command is just better to leave well enough alone. So uh, we recognize like it's not perfect. And the risk is that the chain of command at Echelon would not follow through. So the way it started, the way it gained some traction was the young troopers would just take pictures of whatever they were doing, like take selfies and Instagram them to me, like, you know, Snapchat them to me or whatever and say, Hey, sir, I did this. And I'd go right back and say, okay, you got this number of points, show whoever's in charge of you so you can get your weekend. And that became 
unsustainable pretty fast. <laughs> you know, like yeah, it became unsustainable pretty fast. Um, so the we just the I think uh, each of the battalions does it a little bit differently, and each of the companies does it a little bit differently. But we haven't once we sort of laid out for the younger commanders at Echelon that like, hey, this is about trust. Like honoring this is about trust. And as soon as you don't honor it, that will be a your your irrevocable break in trust. We haven't had a uh, we haven't had any issue. And obviously, that would be the risk is that somebody doesn't get it or doesn't like it, like any policy. Um, so yeah, it's, I think um, I think I don't have any. You know, we don't have any evidence necessarily to draw causality but brigade is doing well we've got a lot of people that are doing really well and i think it's maybe part that idea was part of a recipe it seems like it's going well well and i don't want to hang on the policy letter too long but one last thing i wanted to point out is it's interesting that you, as a if you do any of these tasks i mean to include some of the educational stuff as a team you get more oh, yeah. points which is an interesting oh, yeah. way of incentivizing the teamwork component of it yeah, absolutely. And right. And intentionally, because uh, I'm trying to reduce like the isolation in the barracks and reduce people's tendency to spend time together and connected to some device is part of part of the recipe. Nice. So as you've mentioned with soldiers being able to like Instagram message you their pictures of their events and stuff, you're, you're pretty active on there. And one thing I saw you addressing very directly were issues with the DFAC. And mm -hmm. I think this ties in nicely with what Drew just said about, about incentivizing team cohesion kind of stuff. Cause the more I look at DFAC problems, the more I think it's, it's just as much, if not more about getting teams of people breaking bread together and like the, the fellowship component of a unit eating in the same place as it is about the nutrition itself. What, what made you like make the DFAC a personal project for you as your brigade commander and how's that going? So, uh, so okay. So two, maybe two, two foundational setups. One, I, I'm old enough that I can remember when battalions had defects. So, like when I was a first lieutenant, I was a food service officer as part of my additional duties in the battalion. We had our own 92 golfs and we had our own dining facility. And this was, you know, like before the modularity of the brigade combat teams. Anyway. So, and I can remember uh, the unit culture being sort of baked into the, the dining facilities, the, the chow halls or whatever. And what's also true is our Army's best units, like if, if you were to go to our Army's most elite formations of where guys are, guys, whether the men and women are at lunchtime, or breakfast time, to your point, they're generally eating together in the unit dining facility. So I think that's a reasonable model. Um, I think, you know, there's just so much written. There's just so much. Uh, there's just so many ideas that revolve around problems that can be solved. if We just slow down and ate a meal together. So, so that's sort of like the, the back background. And within a brigade commander's power, there's not, you know, like, it's not unlimited. There's only so many things you can control and leader influence in the dining facility is one of them. And I, I do, I would highlight that we didn't at the brigade command level, we didn't actually do much other than ask. So we run two dining facilities and we just asked the command sergeant major from, from each of our rifle battalions to be in charge. And so each dining facility has a command sergeant major that pays, pays attention. And, you know, once you have a command sergeant major to pay attention, things, things just go better. So my job the last couple of years has involved going all over the army and eating in a lot of defects and training in a lot of army gyms and things like that. And mm -hmm. if, if we've noticed one thing, it's that the, the clearest indicator of whether a lot of soldiers are eating in a defect is whether the command team is eating in the defect. Do, do you and your sergeant major eat in the defect routinely? Is that part of your routine or? Oh yeah, absolutely. The uh, right, you'd be the world's biggest hypocrite to say that <laughs> the food in the defect isn't good enough for me. I've got to go to pick your fast food place. No, we 
you know, breakfast five days a week and lunch three, three or four days a week in the DFAC. Well, you, I mean, you say that, but we, we see routinely people saying their soldiers should eat in the DFAC more, wondering why their soldiers don't eat in the DFAC more, and then they themselves never eat in that DFAC that they own. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm picturing, I know I'm wrong here, but I'm picturing the DFAC in Italy, just like a cornucopia of delicious food. I know it's not, but I'm just picturing for some reason well, an Italian DFAC, like, oh, you want some, you know, fresh pizza? Well, you know, there, you know, so there, there are structural things that you work through, you know, they're like the elongated supply lines, um, some of the regulatory requirements of, of where the food comes from. And we've gotten really pretty sophisticated about paying attention to it and paying attention to the supply lines, paying attention to the ordering processes and the turnover and the fresh produce, because, you know, it's, it is in order that you've got to stay clearly within the parameters of what the army says a dining facility is. And it'd be somebody else's podcast in another day to say whether or not those parameters are good or not. But, you know, you, the, I would say emphasis and sort of leadership within those parameters is the, you can make a reasonable difference, I think. Especially if the SARG majors are on board, you can make, yeah, that helps. Did you get any pushback, I should say, from, you know, installation command, other senior leaders, whatever, when you kind of started to focus in on on that type of initiative? No, I think, no, we're really lucky. Our garrison commander, uh, Mac Omlak, he's, he's great. He's a great teammate. And the logistics readiness command folks, they're really... They're really great teammates. And so they um, they own the facility. They own the equipment. And I own the cooks and the contract that sort of like provides, you know, some of the additional manpower and, you know, all the resource shortfalls. We've got to, got to contract out. So we own the manpower and they own the facilities. And, and it works. It works pretty good. Nice. So I want to I want to quote you to you if you'll allow me. Uh, this was again from your symposium presentation. And you said, if we're serious about the health and holistic fitness of our force, it's time to consider whether Burger King and hard alcohol at predatory pricing and at profit is worth what we all know it's tied to. You said, I've been counseled that it's all about money. That doesn't make it better. That makes it so much worse. And if I recall, I think you got applause after you said that. And so I want to ask you how you engaged with AFES on reducing the alcohol sales. And if you, if you had any kind of issue with them, you know, fighting back, cause you're essentially chipping away at their, at their profits. Yeah. So in <clears throat> this is an ongoing, it's an ongoing dialogue. Right? Sure. So sure. AFES AP, obviously is a, is a private company with a, with a unique um, relationship and they provide unique and necessary services to, to us. Right. We, we need each other. Um, but there are environmental concerns in Italy that are just like that they take your breath away. And so mm -hmm. the our drinking age for soldiers is 18. And uh, the closest caloric substance to the barracks is alcohol in huge volumes. And when we we uh when we looked at it, like basically how assaults occur in the barracks in the first quarter of FY21, we had nine assaults in the barracks. That's like egregious. And when we looked at what was happening, they all, like they all involved, not alcohol, they all involved hard alcohol and they all involved some type of grooming, like some type of like setup. Uh, and maybe not all, but 80 or 90 percent, seven or eight of those nine involved some type of setup. And then where the perpetrator did or said something that that was that was victimizing to another human being. And so when we we took that math to the garrison command team and to the local APs manager and we just asked for a prototype, you just reduce the hard alcohol sales in one of the shop bets. And the, uh, not all, and what we specifically asked for was please don't put anything on sale and please don't sell anything in larger than one liter bottles. 
like just trying to modify consumer habits just a little bit. What can you carry in one hand? And, uh, you know, I don't, we don't have any uh, causality, but the, the apparent impact was remarkable. And so like, you know, the assaults are down 90% and we've done other things, obviously. So I think there's probably like a confounding set of variables, but the hard alcohol volume discount predatory pricing is, is definitely one of the, uh, is definitely one of the variables. So, you know, again, we've got a great team and we definitely live in tension where like, you know, you got to make money. So we try and identify product lines that if he's will find acceptable in the type of store that we have on the post that we, that will make them money and provide services to the soldiers without creating an unsafe or, um, you know, sort of a unnecessarily unsafe environment in the barracks. What do you, so I'm just curious about this because it's, it's a thread that we have seen a couple of times, especially when we're talking to people in leadership positions on the active duty side of the house. Like you're, you're in an environment on a military installation where there are people and businesses looking to profit off of soldiers. And sometimes that's a good thing. I mean, everybody needs to, you know, buy and sell products. We get that. But when Alex and I talk to people about, you know, obesity in the military and like hard alcohol that you mentioned, just things that seem so obvious that they would not necessarily add to a net gain as a commander, how does that how do you handle or or think about or conceptualize that scenario? And is it just sort of constant messaging to soldiers about making the right decisions? Or is there something different at play here where we could eventually maybe work towards a world where we don't have so much fast food on installation, so much hard alcohol, so many temptations that take soldiers away from what we know is effective, if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, so let me, <laughs> let me, let me gracefully sidestep. Yeah. Well, I figured that'd be tenuous. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. Um, you know, we, I try to, tr we, we try to try to make an impact where we can. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's, there are just things that are beyond the scope of, they're just things that you can't control um, in all, all domains of life. And so you look at, you look at what you can control and you do your best with, what you can with the responsibilities and authorities that you have and you just want to do your best. And I trust that uh, like institutionally over time that the army, you know, that will evolve um, in sort of a, a direction that supports the H2F and, and total wellness of the force. So I'll, I'll riff one last time on the atheist thing and then we'll get off this like potentially legally sketchy topic. But uh I was I was curious because I went I walked through the PX here at Fort Eustis several months ago and a bunch of new supplements were for sale and a bunch of new advertisements were up around those supplements. And the advertisements were like explicitly contradictory to the Department of Defense's own supplement guidelines, supplement inf information, all that stuff. And they were selling things that we would never want soldiers to take, frankly. And like asking about it, I revealed like it, it became clear that like nobody really knew what was going on. So I I I sent a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request to AFES. Um, instead of answering my questions, they just took down a lot of the advertisements because they hadn't. There is no like dietitian at AFES. There's nobody to evaluate the truth of these claims or whether they're safe or not. Um, but but I did get some things back from that Freedom of Information Act request, which were the minutes of their last couple of board of directors meetings and. It just seems odd to me. You described their their unique structure in that they're a private company, but the board of directors are all active duty senior leaders from the Army and the Air Force. Um, it it included what they consider for concessionaires on installations, and the considerations are economic, financial risk, customer service, employment opportunities, management control, operational risk, and investment opportunities. None of those are nutrition, performance, health, any of the things we might want. And it it stuck out to me that it was a uh, it appears to have been August of 2022 when the Government Accountability Office first realized that AFES and MWR are part of an installation's food programs and should be considered when evaluating the nutrition environment. And it 
that seems like borderline ludicrous to me. And Drew and I, at some point, will will do a whole AFES episode because people know we talk about this a lot and we don't want to put a brigade commander on the spot talking about AFES. But it's just so strange that these private companies have like such dominance over the food environment that our soldiers are in. And it's led by the same leaders who are telling subordinate leaders that we should be working on the nutritional readiness and the the like healthy diets of our soldiers when we're like fighting ourselves to some degree. I don't know if there was a question there so much as just a rant, but there was not a question. (laughs) Uh, That was not not a question, but you know, to right. That's sort of like, um, they're just, they're just things you can't control and influence. And so when the SAR major and I looked at the dining facility, that is something that we can influence. We can't, we can't make it revolutionarily different than what the army wants, obviously, but we can make it the best it can be within the parameters of health. And so I think you just like a general leadership, maybe the general leadership takeaway would be just do the best you can with what you've got, with what the nation has asked you to do. And, um, trust that the right leaders at echelon are going to move in the right direction over time i, I do it's fair i'll take that alex loves a foia i should have pointed that out as he was talking <laughs> he loves the freedom of information act <laughs> it it turned out to be way easier than i thought it was when i did my first one so, now so he's just gone it. he's gone ham <laughs> which, which probably is not something that a brigade commander wants to hear but that's fine <laughs> no it's it's great. I'm interested <laughs> to see what you've dug up on us. <laughs> uh, I have had no reason to FOIA anything related to Italy or 173rd. Don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll pivot to somewhat safer territory. Another topic you discussed in your presentation was stress inoculation theory. Mm-hmm. And for the audience, like the simplest summary of that is it's a, a cycle that starts with building a trusting relationship, teaching coping skills, practicing in simulated environments with real stress and some risk, and then reflecting and growing. And I was going to ask, like, how do you take that from theory to practice in your brigade? What have you guys done with that model? So I'm a, I, I should start with, I'm a, you know, the, the science is real. I'm a, I'm a firm believer. And I think, I think everybody at this point understands how impactful cohesion is like when you when you submit to um to others when you are genuinely when you genuinely feel a sense of connectedness that is very powerful it um it's very powerful on an individual level it's very powerful in terms of being able to like build shared resiliency and all of those things so we we uh we've taken two stabs at it the first one to be honest uh it didn't it didn't work all that well we uh we essentially used the r2 performance team which is great and they they built a program of instruction around like the master resiliency trainer course they sort of like simplified that a little bit and they would issue that or, you know, give that or talk that through to the to different platoons. And we had a series of assessments and, and there was no, um, there was no benefit. We couldn't, we did three iterations of this. And the, the third one is actually wrapping up in the analytical phase right now. And we're going to get the out brief from the Walter Reed Army Institute for Research next week, actually. But all indications are that it didn't really it didn't really make a ton of difference that our exposure to the R2 performance teams and the MRT curriculum by organic platoon didn't didn't help in any measurable way. Then we tried again with a similar POI, like an MRT based POI program of instruction, except we we had the chaplains um, we had the chaplains serve as sort of the facilitators and we moved it off post and we moved it out of uniform and we moved it out of the classroom PowerPoint slide setting, essentially into the hills. And so we've got this program called Tough in Spirit in which basically it's like, it's like outward bound meets 
uh, strong bonds for platoons over a 48 hour period. And the chaplains take guys up into the mountains and they hike with them. And they talk about purpose and selflessness and commitment and cohesion. They share a nice meal together. Um, they'll camp out somewhere, or st you know, stay in some sort of rustic lodge and, and that'll go for two or three days. And that has, that's, you know, I think it's been very well received. So before we move on from that, the way you phrased it made it sound like very casual stroll in the woods kind of stuff. <laughs> and no. my, my impression is it's not that. And I think people no, need to there's understand. Some grit, there's some grit to it. It's, <laughs> it's pretty, because the, the recipe is you want people, we want people to experience perseverance. And so we're finding events that people can achieve but they may not know up front that they can do it, whether it's some type of canyoning thing or a range movement or some type of climbing activity or something with some height or elevation or exposure. Um, and then we'll, we'll get the right guides and the right safety mechanisms. And, uh, but the idea is that you experience perseverance and you get a common reference point for a, uh, at the platoon level. And this uh, to give you, you know, like we're, we're very optimistic that we're very hopeful and optimistic that this is having an impact. And so I don't, I don't have all of the, all of the math in front of me, but one of the numbers that sticks out. So we looked at the individual paratrooper and we ran the statistical analysis that for an individual paratrooper who has spent a concentrated amount of time with his or her chaplain on a tough and spirit event, they're, their individual rate of risk of generating a serious incident report is 83% lower than a paratrooper who is not. So all of the paratroopers in the brigade have got like, you know, there's a, there's a probability that any of us are going to generate an SIR on any given day just by virtue of being paratroopers in the world. And for the folks who have spent time with the chaplain, that individual risk rate is 83% lower uh, than the guys and gals who have not. <clears throat> and that math is holding steady. And when you consider that about 75% of people who generate an SIR end up being separated for it in some capacity, that's a huge return. It is a massive retention return to be able to hold on to folks who would otherwise be doing things that we'd have to separate. So I don't think you used the word prevention there. And I think that's really interesting for a few reasons. Um, the, the DOD at large is very interested in the concept of prevention right now, preventing corrosive behaviors, preventing suicide, whatever the thing mm -hmm. you want to prevent is. But without labeling your program prevention, you are generating data that indicates it's preventing the things that senior leadership tends to worry about. Should we be like, are we missing the yeah. point here? Should we be more focused on cultivating the things we do want than preventing the things we don't want and just let the outcomes take care of themselves? Is that kind of the strategy here? Cause it seems like it's working. Uh, I, I don't know, but I don't know. That's a good question. And what I take away from your question is as we try to communicate, you know, we're, we're trying to communicate to the army what we're doing and the resources we're putting into it and what we think the effects are. Um, the most we're trying to show them off the most of it and uh, <laughs> right and so that's what I'm wondering is if we may be if our if our message is off to your point exactly so this is I mean this is a little bit of a tangent related to what you just talked about with your initiative because one of the obviously with you know the army's h trust system spirituality is a big piece of that and one of the things we've tried to do here with this platform is, you know, we've brought on chaplains, we've brought on folks where, you know, quote unquote, spiritual fitness is kind of their thing. But I think that there's still a lot of uncertainty around how to effectively implement chaplains into this type of thing. And it seems like, I mean, for your brigade case in point, you, you tried to go their traditional sort of R2 route and it didn't work. You found success with chaplains. So I'd be curious your thoughts on like, what is... I mean, maybe what is spirituality in sort of a broad sense, but more importantly, like how have you tangibly inserted chaplains into this kind of performance space? Because I think that that's a really cool takeaway for people. Yeah. So, well, that's the, it, it's the 
differentiating aspect why we think the current initiative is working in the R2 performance. In this particular case, we just didn't have as good an impact was because the chaplains were inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt in terms of trusting them. Without, without knowing the chaplain personally, based purely on their position, um, we think they've got an easier time getting soldiers to trust their hands. That makes sense. And then as a follow-on for that, and this is kind of a thing that I've seen I guess, feature with all of the things I've heard you talk about is this kind of willingness to accept risk and a willingness to accept uncertainty. I mean, with a lot of these programs, even the policy letter we brought up, you know, when the podcast started, it's never a definitive. It's always like, well, it's it's not perfect. Well, we tried it. We're willing to, you know, look at the data and let it play out. Is that something... I mean, this might be a strange question, but within yourself, is that something you've had to foster? And then as a brigade commander, something you've had to kind of reinforce with people that work for you, like this openness and acceptance of, hey, if there's a good idea you have, let's try it and let's run with it and let's see how it plays out versus we got to get results now. And if we don't get results now, it must not have worked. Um, well, I, I think uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that I, other than to say the majority of, of my peer groups, military experience has been at war. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we talk about risk, like I've just, I've got a different, you know, if people say like, Hey, like there's risk in this spiritual chaplain retreat program you guys are doing, that risk is pretty low relative to like a patrol in 2007. <laughs> That's <Eric>. fair. <laughs> so I think the the next obvious thing to talk about, because we've talked a lot of, about like some fuzzier stuff, but this podcast tends to usually focus on physical fitness. It, it certainly touches on domains around that, but a lot of what we do is the physical fitness component. Um, and again, Drew quoted you to you. I'm going to do the same thing. And you have and a lot quote, of quotes. I'm going to quote your presentation again. But you said that from a brigade commander's point of view, physical training is not about physical training. It's about awakening the warrior spirit, leader development, building cohesive teams, that kind of stuff. I think this one can be a little bit hard for strength and conditioning professionals working with the military. Shouldn't shouldn't at least part of the outcomes we look for from physical training be producing physical fitness outcomes? And I think this also ties back. So there's like a question two here, which is the risk tolerance thing. I think one of the metrics we always focus on is injuries, but there's going to be a certain amount of that if you're doing tough, realistic training. So like resolving that yeah. conflict as well. Yeah. So I think, um, so, <clears throat> I think if you have, if you have a, uh, if you're doing leader led PT in which the, the squad leader, the appropriate section NCO is present and the officers are present or visible, like, you know, like nearby, um, in a way that doesn't necessarily encroach on that NCO's authority and those young soldiers are being led and like the leaders are sharing the hardship and they're being led by example and there's a modicum of programming like there's a there's at least a plan and it's it, it's got an attempt at balance between strength and endurance and power and all of those things i think the uh i think the outcomes the outcomes will be fine the ACFT score and the 12 mile road march will be will be fine. Not only will they be fine, they'll be in like top 80, 85 percent. And I, I, you know, we could certainly like I'm as eager as anybody to like nerd out on athletic programming and you know like really like drill down. But I think I've come to I've come to believe that that there are greater outcomes on the battlefield than only the physicality. And if we do those other things, right, the physicality will follow pretty, pretty seamlessly. Well, I'll say one thing. So 
before I, before I left active duty, my last assignment was teaching master fitness trainer Mm -hmm. and the two most common AAR comments we got from former graduates of the course were one, like best course I've ever been to. This was awesome. And we, we love hearing that. And that's cool. Those are the ones that Alex wrote and snuck into the box. Exactly. And then comment number two (laughs) was my leadership never lets me use it. And that's the hard part. And I've, I've said on this podcast before that, that one of the things that troubled me the most, and this is, it ties to the name of the podcast, right? Like actually measuring the effectiveness of interventions is that I had a ton of fun teaching that course. I think it's a great course. I think it's great content. I think it prepares people well to do certain things that can add value to units, but I don't know whether it actually made a difference because of the frequency with which I heard that people didn't ever get to really implement the things they learned. And that's why I've been excited to hear from a whole bunch of NCOs from 173rd who actually have been empowered, who, who sought out like some of our content specifically because it served as like continuing education as master fitness trainers who were getting to do things on the ground. I don't have like a really specific question, but can you just talk to the way you've prioritized that and empowered those NCOs and given them a chance to really implement the things they've learned in a constructive way? Um, so what we, you know, like what we aspire to, what I think all units aspire to is to have an NCO core that, that feels a sense of ownership and is truly empowered, right? To like own the culture of the organization, uh, the performance of the, of the brigade and to own the, the well-being of the, and of the paratroopers, the soldiers and, and sort of the readiness of the unit. So that's, that's our aspiration. I think if you ask any any commander in the army, any command sergeant major in the army, that's their aspiration. Probably. And I think um, <clears throat> the mass, master fitness training or the master fitness trainer course and send guys to the course, that's just one of the, I'm not saying one of the easy ways, but it's one of the, um, it's one of, it's one of this, because uh, it's not certainly not easy, but it's one of the simple ways to, that you can quantify that, that you can sort of follow through, that you can sort of describe like, hey, that that guy or gal now has some level of expertise and we expect the junior commanders at Echelon to allow them to impart that expertise. And certainly, certainly we've gotten feedback that that has not happened. Just to your point, we've gotten that same feedback. But when you see the good, you got you to gotta nurture it. And when you see the good, when you see it happening, when you see the company commander or the platoon sergeant, or you see the young leader allowing that junior NCO to to step up um, and and do what we expect, you just just put a nice positive spotlight on that and, and hope that it grows. You so I know with with the one seventy third, you guys don't have you know, embedded civilian or even active duty assets. I mean, when we think of, you know, H2F and what that means for a brigade, but, but that, I mean, clearly you have not let that hold you guys back when it comes to creating the type of culture that I would argue H2F is designed to instill in the first place. So this may be once, you know, you've left command, but down the road when the 173rd does inevitably get assets, how how would you envision that conversation going when a bunch of civilians show up and like this culture already exists where you've got things like the policy letter you've you've taken action against things like alcohol sales like you've created change and now there's this new team how would you envision bringing those folks into the fold i think maybe that what you'd hope for is when you've got that level of technical expertise that they could really you could really find goodness in terms of like continuing education over the shoulder coaching to your nco core um like injury prevention program design and and the things maybe the things that like units struggle to have capacity for like golly man if if we just had another six months we could have the best profile PT program in the army, right? But everything takes time and capacity and attention. And so I think if you're deliberate about it, you could you could really laser laser those guys in to to help um, to help reinforce the 
sort of aspects of, of cultural change that you're looking for rather than maybe the fear of undermining, you know, undermining your non-commissioned officers or providing or or creating creating a situation where a young sergeant might might not feel completely empowered. Mm -hmm. A quick question briefly, because we've been talking kind of about continuing education of of MFTs and just NCOs leading fitness in general. I I think the SPEAR program at 173rd existed prior to you. It seems like something that has like waxed and waned over the last few mm -hmm. years at 173rd. Can you speak to what the SPEAR program is and what that does for the brigade? Yeah. So so the way that the way this evolved was we we fell in. So the previous command sergeant major and I, command sergeant major Chris Clapham, he and I fell in on on a spear program. We had a little book, but it didn't it didn't have an owner at the time, if that made sense. It didn't have a proponent, and to and like so many things in the army, it was sort of had sort of ebbed and flowed with depending on whoever's in charge, and that's why we we invested so heavily in in sending folks to the master fitness course because it has the stability of the institution to it. And it it means something within the NCO professional development. It's it's not just something we made up. It's got actual it's got teeth. So that that was why we invested in the MFT, uh, MFT POI. And then um, Captain Chris Boyer, our physical therapist, has done a great He's done a great job, and he, if you don't know him, he'd be worth. He, he'd be a great person to talk to as well. He, um, he grabbed a hold of our spear program, and essentially took the MFT POI and extrapolated it into our local facilities and into sort of the you know our local parameters and said, hey, this is this is the the doc this is the doctrine of what you learned, um, and here's how to implement that given the resources available in terms of space and hours available and, and just sort of how physical training unfolds in the unit. A good shout out to Chris. I've talked to Chris plenty and we should definitely get him on because he's doing, he's essentially like a one man H2F team in a lot of ways, implementing a lot yeah. of programs that normally a whole team has to do. So really good stuff going on there. And I think, um, I think made so I, in partnership. So we're not, we're not a resourced quote unquote brigade, but we've got, you know, we've made good relationships. We've just got a great working relationship with the MWR strength coaches, the guy over there named Josh Grant. And, uh, you know, we've, we're, we've built, um, we've, you know, we're just in a good community of interest. I do. I want to underline what you just said, because I think it's really important because the, the terms like resourced and unresourced get thrown around a lot. And I hear people from quote unquote unresourced units saying like, well, I have no resources. So what am I supposed to do? Which is like ludicrous when you take a step That's back crazy. and and talk even for a moment about the amount of resources that already exist between army wellness centers, between R2 performance centers, MWRs that have coaches and classes and things you can do The you guys have partnered with Walter Reed army suit of research. You mentioned earlier, there's consortium for health and military performance with tons of free resources, human performance resource center, they're like the, the amount of resources that are available if people just took the time to seek them out and like deliberately integrate them into the ways units work is is pretty impressive. It's better than a lot of like small collegiate athletics programs have access to if you if you really took advantage of it. And I wanna like say that loudly for the audience is that if you're not taking advantage of the resources that already exist, why should the army invest more resources? Because you're you're sending a message that you don't value the ones you already have and you're not going to take advantage of it. So that's a tough conversation. Yeah. All right. This one, I, I don't know if we're going to agree or disagree here. We're, we're running out of time in our hour, but I want to, I want to talk about one. Um, it seems like your, your go-to workout. And this is, I asked this specifically because we're recording here. Yeah, on I was gonna say, this is very, very timely. Yeah. It seems like your go-to workout to welcome new paratroopers to the 173rd is to do Murph. Why, why that particular workout? Is that the one you always do or does it rotate? What, what's your thought there? Um, so it, it, it evolves. Um, it's an evolution, but yeah, it's what we're on now is a, is a version of Murph. Um, but 
there's the answer is not maybe as complicated as you would want it to be. It's because the facilities lend themselves to it. It's because if you break up the pull-ups and push-ups and body weight squats, most people can get through it. You know, like it's it's scalable. You can do it if you've got like a nice big set of pull-up bars. You can look at everybody. You can talk to them through it. And we do it at conversation pace and we take breaks every six or seven rounds and we have like a little lesson and we'll spot each other and it takes about an hour like you know so it's it is it is a uh, remark it's really sort of interesting um we'll tell people on the front end of the 20 rounds of what's going to happen because we'll break it up and walk you know we sort of walk through it together mm-hmm. and uh there's there are some young soldiers that say like i'm not i'm not doing that but most people most young soldiers and most of our NCOs can. Um, and so it's a challenging workout, but certainly not out of reach for most of our army. Murph is always a conversation starter for me because like Murph has a reputation for giving people rhabdo sometimes if they're not prepared for it. Well, time out, pause, because for some people who are listening to this and for, I don't know why you would not know what Murph is, but as written, it's with a 20 pound weight vest, mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and another mile run. Mm-hmm. So like, on paper, you would see that and be like, holy shit, you're making all the new soldiers do that. But like you mentioned, you can scale it, you can slow it down. Like, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. Like, it is one of the more, I guess you could say, flexible workouts you could do. I mean, because, man, if you were out there having everybody do, what's the one? It's like 30 clean and jerks for time or whatever. Like, I could see how this could go very wrong. <laughs> sure. No, it's it's super, uh, super scalable. Um, depending on how fast you run and how you pace it, and it's pretty. We've got it down to where. Do you probably, do you do it with them every time? Oh yeah, absolutely. Nice. And then you go to the defect with them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's the right answer. Of course. <laughs> you know the other the other. I mean, I'll tell you candidly. Um, the other reason we do it. So, like, here's a pro tip: if you want to be, if you want to. Like I've been doing this a long time, right? I'm almost 49 years old, so I pick the workouts that I can do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just to be completely honest, yeah. so that's why I'm laughing because when you say like, "Why do you do Murph?" Well, we do Murph because I can do it. <laughs> you know, I, like I, I can like show that. up every time and do it. Just that's to be how... completely. Just well, to be completely. Honest. A little sneak peek for the 173rd on how the sausage is made. <laughs> I, I do like it though, because there's there's a point to be made in there. Because every year Murph comes around and a lot of people who do it are sore, like seriously sore for like three, <laughs> four days afterwards because they absolutely got wrecked by it. And what that tells you right away is that those people like didn't really prepare for it, don't really do high volume training of that kind of stuff in general. Because if you are prepared for it, like it sounds like you are, you can do Murph. And then continue with what you were doing for the rest of the week with no real interruption. If big, if you've built that foundation of tolerance to training volume that I think is pretty important in the tactical setting. And uh, what's your lifestyle, Mm -hmm. right? It's mostly a matter of lifestyle. I'd I'd hate to say like, man, I don't, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not sure I could describe to my training regime other than, you know, like, just try and get get through it, but um, but I think if you if you live a pretty active and healthy lifestyle that we would aspire to 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 live and for our troopers and soldiers to live, yeah, I think that's it all sort of adds up. I think the other thing that's interesting about that is like, I mean, we we sort of touched on this a little bit in our our episode with um, Doctor East and kind of the history of physical culture and and using physicality as a way of creating teams. And in your case, as part of newcomers showing up to the brigade, they're sort of immediately exposed to this mindset of like, we're going to, as a team, accomplish this, this thing. And it's not, I, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but like, it's not a pass fail. There's not a score associated with it. It's just an event that could be challenging for some, but like you mentioned, scalable, and it immediately gets the message across to everyone that shows up at your brigade. Hey, we value this. This is important. So have you seen, I mean, I guess the question baked into that is like, have you seen how that component of people showing up has paid dividends down the road when you start to implement things like a policy letter 
like, you know, embedding, you know, a physical therapist kind of creating H2F, those types of things. Have you seen positive return on investment? Um, you know, to I wouldn't know how to measure it. Mm-hmm. I feel I feel like we've got leaders at Echelon who are doing the best they can and who care about their paratroopers. And I feel like, uh, you know, in, in general, the the underlying cultural tenets of the organization are, you know, as, as good as they can be, um, as good as, as good as we know to make them to be. But in terms of measuring direct outcomes, I, I, don't, I wouldn't, I don't know how to do it. Like, you know, it's just, I don't know, but it's definitely a, like it's definitely a baseline framework common experience. And I think um, to your point, you know, you could have your newcomers briefing in a classroom with PowerPoint slides, or you can have your newcomers briefing at a set of pull-up bars and they each say something. Yeah, no, that's very true. And I want to ask you another question about that. And this isn't, this isn't meant to target the VA by any means, but we did have an episode talking about the VA and how it incentivizes, you know, people being broken, people being hurt. Is there a way that you could take, and again, not related to the VA, but just a broader conversation about incentivizing performance, incentivizing health, incentivizing like you've done with your policy letter, change in a positive direction versus, I guess we could say change in a negative direction. Like have you, if you could put a bow on all of your experiences as a brigade commander that is very physically focused at the 173rd, what does that look like to you to incentivize cultural change towards high performance? Well, it's what that it's what our policy letter to that we talk start talking about is mm-hmm. is an attempt to do, but I don't I wouldn't know how to scale that larger than a brigade combat team. And I think maybe the beauty of our army is that you know the beauty of our army is that some things aren't necessarily given to us to scale. We've got the latitude. Junior commanders have, have the latitude and the autonomy to look at their environment and their problems and challenges and try and develop local solutions that will work for the problems that they've got in front of them. Well, we're we're coming up to the hour mark and we don't want to take any more of your Memorial Day weekend here. He has to go to Murph. It's true. But uh <laughs> but I do want to ask, so we've we've talked you talked about leaders at Echelon, you talked about leaders doing their best to talk about what you've done at brigade level. If, if you were given the keys to the kingdom for the day, if you were in charge of the army for a day, what would you like? Do any of the, do you think any of the things you've implemented at 173rd scale to the whole army? What would you implement for the entire million soldiers? So my aha moment at the war college was when Sergeant major of the army, uh, Princeton came and spoke to us. And he he said, hey, it's not about it's not about readiness for people first. It's building readiness by putting people first. And I know it sounds so simple, but that's like the lights came on. And I really think I really think we're on to something. And I think it's good and I think it's appropriate. And I really think that the idea that if you if you do your very, very best, um, to take care of the men and women under your charge, then in the long run, they'll do their very best to accomplish the mission. I'm a, I'm a total believer. And I think that's, I think that's a, we're on the right track. Well, to close it out, I want to say, first of all, thank you for your time. I know it's later over there in Italy and it's a holiday weekend. And I will say that for all the folks listening, when we put the policy letter in the show notes, please do not slide into Colonel Klepper's DMs asking for points because unless you're in the 173rd, it means absolutely nothing. Now, that's not to say don't go out and do the things, but if people start sliding into your DMs, just just let us know. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Okay, great. I appreciate the time, guys. Y'all have a great day. Thanks for your service. Hey, Alex. Let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us 
on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter N, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and we receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in-depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.